apologies for absence. The only apology I have is from Michael Green. Oh, John Gibson. John Gibson. John Gibson. Uh, anyone else? I think that's about it. Members, if if you're on um, VC or uh, are engaging remotely, can you please turn your camera off and only turn your camera on when you're speaking? It makes the the whole thing easier to see for all of you. Thank you. Item two on the agenda is declarations of interest, and those declarations are primarily for members. But if you wish to speak on an item and you're not a member of the committee, then you may also consider whether you have a declaration to Any declarations? No. Item three of the agenda is appointment of vice chairs. I'm looking for nominations for vice chair. Callum. I nominate Councillor Brendan, please, vice chair. Okay. I nominate Andrew Jarvie. Okay. Second. Whether, any other nominations? Okay. Since there are two positions and no other nominations, Councillors Bremner and Jarvie are duly elected as the Vice Chairs. Item four in the agenda is the minutes. Can we agree the minutes, please? I realise that the majority of you will not have been there, so can we just agree the minutes? Item five is the overview of the redesign board. So Okay. Matt. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, and uh, welcome, as uh, well said, uh, sorry, as, as the Chair said, to this first board of the Council. And um, the purpose of the board, sorry, the purpose of the overview report. I need to speak up a wee bit, Matt. Sorry, big pardon. The purpose of the overview report really is to give um, board members just a, a reminder of what redesign is about. Um, so it provides an overview of the purpose. And also, you'll see further on in the report what we refer to as the redesign framework uh, of how we look at services and make decisions on what, how best to deliver those services. So under um, item four, sorry, section four on the agenda, a um, couple of highlights to, to put out on that. The purpose of the board is really to, to look at specific areas of service delivery to produce proposals that will be put to council. And <coughs> items one and two under, under that section talk about being much more open-minded about how we deliver services and are probably brought into sharp relief given the situation, budgetary situation um, these days. Uh, and also to be more commercially minded, so look at opportunities where we can generate income and be more commercially minded. Under section 4.2, that's where we refer to the uh, redesign review process framework, and that effectively has been in place for the redesign board since 2016. Uh, and I think um, you know, still stands the test of time. And just a couple of highlights from the, the 10 sort of considerations under the framework are where we're running um, services in house is to make sure they're efficiently run and effectively run with a, a view on the, the customer. Uh, and that brings into play where we talk about lean and business improvement in, uh, methodologies, and uh, they'll we'll cover that under item six on the agenda. Also about looking at services in partnership with, with other organisations, and so we are making uh, best use of those uh, relationships and, and partnerships. And finally, um, number 10 on the framework is, as I mentioned, commercial opportunities. So building on what we already do uh, from a commercial uh, perspective and look at new opportunities um, to that end. But Appendix 1 uh, is mentioned under 4.3 is the list of previous redesign board projects. And what you can see there is a fair sort of scope and scale of work that touches almost all of the organisation. And that, that is one of the, the, the key benefits of the redesign board. In terms of how the redesign board play into um, projects and the programme, um, it comes in sort of three ways. So first and foremost, um, the formal board that we've got here today, so that's the, the redesign board, typically taking sort of proposal recommendations from the, the groups that have been working on uh, particular projects and putting that forward to, to council. Redesign workshops, um, and we're looking to have one uh, fairly soon, beginning of October ideally, are in private, so they're, they're not in, in public and really offer a real opportunity for a collaboration uh, between members and officers to really figure out what is the best way moving forward with a particular area of service delivery or areas of service delivery. 
And finally, project team. So we have and will continue to have um, and members of this board embedded in particular project teams so that they are you know, quite hands-on uh, with, with moving the work forward. And finally, under section five, um, redesign board benefits, aside from the specific benefits related to uh, various projects, the, the general sort of uh, benefits uh, are listed under 5.1. And I'll just pick out a couple uh, that I think are really, really key, um, is the involvement of staff is critical uh, to this. And you'll see that as, as the board and workshops proceed, staff turning up to, to this board to present what they found in terms of potential improvements. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, that, that opportunity to work alongside officers, elected members, and trade union colleagues and um, to, to um, progress uh, improvement opportunities. So that's all I was going to cover in terms of the uh, overview report. Happy to take uh, questions. And was there any points or, or any questions? No. Oh. Well, oh. yeah. um, well, I suppose for the board, something to consider. Um, part 10 of your framework, commercial opportunities. I suppose it's pertinent and now, certainly with budget coming up, as trade unions, we've talked about commercial opportunities for the last five years, but there's always a stumbling block that as an organisation we cannot do certain things. That needs to be looked at. We, we need to take those barriers away because if we're looking at commercial, we have to be realistic about what we can do and what we can't do. So going forward, I think the board need to consider that. Good point. Councillor Roberts. Yeah, I just wondered, were there any projects uncompleted in the last, because obviously it was new to me, this, and uh, I wondered what was still ongoing. I can pick that up. Um, so um, I'll come back to, to Paul's point in a second, but on that particular uh, point, that previously, prior, prior to um, the, the, the sort of Newcastle Council coming in, we had amenities uh, project, the roads project, and asset management project um, within the, the programme of work uh, for redesign. And we mentioned certainly asset management as part of um, under item six. And also, uh, we will be signalling that we are looking to have a workshop uh, with this board early October to have a look at the programme generally so that the due consideration can be given as to whether those projects continue in redesign or whether there are others that, that, that will come in. Uh, if I may just pick up on, on Paul's uh, point around commercial opportunities, um, I, I do understand your point that sometimes there are, there are um, perceived, um, you know, um, barriers um, to, to, to sort of progressing commercial opportunities, but we are uh, working with Sky and Razay members, for example, on the store project, uh, the Old Man of Store project, which we see as a pathfinder um, to help us get through some of the maybe legal considerations, etc., so that we can say, right, what more can we do beyond um, that particular project, for example. That's okay. Yeah, I think uh, what well, uh, you know, think myself and Councillor Christie would argue whether it's the High Life Highlander or the NHS are our biggest partner, but certainly High Life is one of our biggest partners. Uh, looking at a, a future line of work, maybe it'd be worth you know, literally just asking uh, High Life to come along and ask, you know, what, what could you do for the council? What, um, you know, particularly looking at the music tuition um, thing that, that we did, um, and just simply ask High Life, you know, what parts of the council do you think that you could actually take on? Um, and do better or, or cheaper? My, my personal opinion on that is should be the opposite way around. Um, bearing in mind, High Life Island is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Council. We should be deciding what, what maybe we would ask High Life Island to do or not, as the case may be, rather than asking them to come in and bid for things. Angel. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not a member of the committee. Uh, the redesign review process framework um, I found very helpful and uh, point seven it talks about community run services and also talks about working with partners um, the over the years the redesign board has has done a, made a lot of recommendations to the council which have been accepted and given that things are becoming much more difficult with resources I wondered at what point before the decision by council is made will we consult with the communities? How will that be undertaken in community consultation? Because there may be opportunities out there that 
the re-sign board don't know about? And um, how is that? How is that done? Any thoughts on that? Okay, Matt, okay. Um, I think that it's a really good point. One of the things, as Matt said, and I was going to pick it up under item six, was to, to have a member workshop in October so we can start to work through in more detail what projects we want to take forward and how. And I think the point about the framework is when we're looking at some of the things that we do as an organisation, we look at it through those very various lenses. Mm -hmm. And then we say, look, is it something that we want to do ourselves? Is it something that we want to outsource? If we want to outsource it, who are our partners? Would it be commercial? Would it be community, et cetera? So that's part of that, that review of how we deliver service. We would look at all of those cases. Um, in terms of engaging with, with, with communities on what they might want to take on, uh, on our behalf, I think there's quite a well-developed um, community engagement approach being um, taken forward by communities and places, and Alison Clark is the, the head of community engagement. In terms of that level of engagement that communities want with us and what they want to take on in terms of certainly asset transfer, um, and where services are actually better delivered at community level rather than by ourselves. So we might want to think about how we join those two things together, both kind of that community engagement side of things with redesign. But the other thing I would just add is we need to make sure we focus the resources that we have available to us through redesign on the things that we think will have biggest benefit for, for us because you know we have to, we have limited resources, good resources but limited. So is that that will have the greatest probably financial benefit as not just community benefit in terms of what we take forward under the auspices of this particular project? Professor Brenda. Morning, everybody, um, and uh, good to be back at the redesign process. Just uh, a point on um, on what um, Angela was saying. I, I like um, the 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 thought of uh, becoming more. Uh, community uh, considerate uh, as one of the uh, kind of key principles of the overview of um, re uh, redesign. But um, yeah, in terms of uh, going forward, I think it is kind of uh, items uh, six and seven where some of us have shared ideas and thoughts um, where we have actually uh, put um, uh, services through the redesign process and ideas and thoughts through the redesign process in terms of how we can make them more efficient, more responsive to communities. Um, and 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 for those who are new to the redesign process, you know, um, teams are set up um, across party in terms of who uh, who can be, uh, who, who can actually take a, a kind of joint ownership of some of those uh, process go processes going forward and to help uh, the, the council with the office uh, with the officers and also with advisors uh, who we can determine uh, going through the redesign process and how best we can actually review them and i think that you know so i'll, I'll be welcoming the, the workshop because um uh, and encouraging people uh, as much as possible to actually be be together for that i'll certainly uh, be aiming to do that too and uh, to make sure that uh, it's a it's a kind of fluid um, kind of brainstorming process that we can apply uh, to uh, to help the redesign process go forward, and that can include um, uh, reviewing some of the things that the redesign board have already done, and to uh, to review how effective it was, or how effective it was in its implementation, taking High Life Island as an example in terms of music tuition. And uh, and its transfer from council to High, uh, to High Life Island, but also re reviewing that it might not need to be. Um, in fact, I'll leave my thoughts to uh, to that uh, later on, uh, um, Chair, because um, I, I realise this is actually uh, the overview, um, and just giving uh, members a, a taste of what uh, the, re the redesign process is. But in terms of the mechanics of what the redesign uh, board uh, can actually get underway, uh, sorry, the redesign uh, process in terms of. You, um, having all councillors available to be able to feed into that, that um, I think uh, will be that'll be that'll be a really good uh, uh, chat at the workshop, and also um, maybe something we can reflect on the nine, six, and seven. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Are you? Okay, that's fine. Anybody else? Yes, Don. Um, just to, in terms of points that have been made. The redesign board previously did say that we needed to get um, better at a business case approach. The redesign board did ask us to engage um, a 
uh, increase in legislation. With partners, so we have been engaging with Deloitte, and we have been working um, with a uh, large group of staff across the council, and they are now um, working with us to impose a approach to business case um, approaches. So it might be as part of your workshop that you could include them, and they will be looked at all our materials. Um, and they might come forward with a model that you might want to use um, with that external advice. It's just a suggestion. Well, it's certainly something that we've done in the past, whereas uh, we've had, um, I can't remember if it was Deloitte or someone else, we certainly had one of the, those sort of organisations here who made a really good input into something we were going to do. But certainly, as, as far as the board itself is concerned, there's no doubt about it. In some cases, we should actually refer back and find out just the recommendations we've made, what was delivered. So that I think that's quite important. Okay, you've, you've asked to note the report. Um, item six on the agenda is the redesign board program development. So, Katharina. Thank you. So this is a, a natural progression from the discussion that we've just had, actually. So the, the previous report was kind of more looking backwards and setting the scene for, for how we take forward work under redesign. This is more the kind of looking ahead in terms of what we want to do next. Um, we've got two proposals in terms of substantive large projects that the design board might want to continue, consider continuing with, um, in one case, and starting in case of another. And then, as um, Matt mentioned and I, I did subsequently, we're wanting to arrange a workshop so that we can really start to get, a, get into what else you think the board should be looking at. And the, the framework that you looked at under item five was pretty much what we do in terms of identifying opportunities for change, but there's a variety of ways in which we can deliver that. So the, the two that have been put forward to you today in terms of asset management and uh, customer engagement would be considered quite major projects. They, they um, cut across a huge number of areas. They cut across all of our service delivery areas, certainly, and they have internal and external impact. But we also have opportunities to do quick reviews. So quick reviews, whether it's lean, and the lean methodology is set out in um, uh, the paper under item six, just for those of you that aren't familiar with lean methodology. But there's an, a number of other quick approaches to reviewing things that I think we need to take on board as well, because sometimes we've got major projects. Sometimes we want to go in, do a three-week overview, come back with proposals, and make changes really fast because it's not that big and major, but we can have quite a, a, a quick impact on something. So in terms of the workshop on the 6th of October, we're looking at whether we want to um, have some legacy projects carried forward, and Matt mentioned some of those in terms of the amenities review, for example, and um, uh, roads, and also what new projects we want to take on board and which type of approach you want, might want to apply, whether it's the quick review approach or whether it's a substantial review that would involve yourself sitting on project boards with the senior representatives as well. Um, so on that basis, I'd be keen to get your feedback on the two projects that I mentioned, um, specifically because then we can start to prepare for the next redesign board um, meeting. Um, and in terms of the um, uh, asset management one, the last item on the agenda today is a presentation from Mark and from Malcolm, so you'll really get a sense of the scope and breadth of that particular project, which I think we should get quite excited about. Any questions? I'll oh, a comment, not a question. No, no comments. Okay. I, I, I think you picked, for the big projects, I think you picked the two good ones. That rationalisation is essential because of the budget pressures that are facing continuing on from the past administration and from previous budget papers. And let's, let's be honest, the way we connect with customers now is, is abysmal. Um, you know, I, I, I've got many people that are spending up to an hour on the phone trying to get through, uh, and then they get cut off. Uh, I went to the service point with someone yesterday, you know, queuing in Church Street to get to the service point, about 12 people queuing, so went in, three people serving. Now, the maths of how long people have to wait there, so it's actually shocking as to why the service points are opening at 1.30 to, to 4.30 in the city centre, and why mostly elderly folk are having to spend the best part of an hour on the telephone trying to get through to get an answer phone or, or just you know, there's nobody available to take your call and it gets cut. So I think that one's an essential one that, that needs to be done. Um, my, my latest hobby horse uh, for a lean review is, is trees, isn't it, Alan, Mark and Malcolm? Um, where, you know, trying to get trees dealt with in this authority is, is a nightmare because it depends whose land it's on 
Um, the tree specialists in Malcolm's department, uh, the, the people that cut it down or, or trim and maintain it are in Alan's department. And if it's on corporate landlords, you get market faults. So I've had several meetings with ECUs and staff that must cost thousands and thousands to hold, and yet the maintenance is still not done on the trees. And it seemed a very quick one to go in for a quick review to improve the process, the same way as we did the lettings one some time ago to actually get done, because that's what's impacting people's and annoying people in, in the community, um, that it's not being done. So I think that would be a really good one to do. So that could be miniature, that would be made yeah, my happy. Sure. Well, and, and just in case anyone doesn't know the, the basis behind the reviews, uh, we once uh, stood in this room one day, and that entire wall, from one end to the other, top to bottom, was covered in a hundred or so posted notes. Each posted note was part of the process. When they finished the lean review on the other wall, there was six of them. So you've gone from a gigantic this, 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 and they can really be cut down. So, and that's basically what I was just trying to point out to you. But regarding the point of the um, call centres, as someone who spent a day at a call centre, sitting listening to, to our staff uh, finding calls, it is not the easiest job in the world. So whilst I appreciate that the process does need to be improved, uh, it's in general not the, the frontline staff who are actually answering calls. Graham. Yeah, I just want to respond to Alistair. I agree with you. I mean, it's not acceptable. Uh, but in actual fact, the abandonment rate has reduced considerably since since the election. We're working very hard and making sure that goes further down. And Alan, who has huge experience of having run that in the past, is heavily involved in making looking at the improvements that can be made there. There is, however, it's, it, even when you do get through, there's a, there seems to me to be a disconnect between the service centre and the, the services across the council and yeah. things that go out and cases get closed and, and, and nobody knows why they're closed and we're obviously turning our attention to that as well. And I can say quite clearly, I've been talking to Alison Clark about <laughs> the service points and the arrangements for opening and, and that is under review as we speak. Paul. Thanks, sorry. Um, looking at reviews, I suppose, I've got a different view on the customer care, and uh, that will become clear through the workshops about why people are waiting, and why there's only three staff monitoring or being present at a service point. So I think there's a different aspect to that. Um, but looking at the reviews, and I've looked at the list, and I do kind of hold my head and my hands a wee bit, because some of these reviews need to be more than just a lean. They need to be in depth. Um, I'll pick up on um, fly tipping. There's what we do. Yeah. Um, there's fly tipping. There is agency casual staff. These are big costs for the council. These are more than just a lean review. These are still. I was part of these as well, so that's why I'm really concerned. Well, that's the sort of thing that's good for you to highlight, Paul. So we'll, we'll take that forward. That's just two. There, there could be more. Um, Barbara. Um, in addition to what Alistair was saying, and yourself, Paul, uh, I was speaking to the manager of the Nairn Citizens Advice Bureau and asked her, what is the biggest hurdle for you? And she said the when COVID came along, a lot of their volunteers let, had to work at home because of COVID, and she lost volunteers because their reason for volunteering was to get themselves out of the phone, out of uh, homes. So they have since gone elsewhere. So she said a recruitment officer to recruit and train the ongoing rolling volunteer system because they also get people from school coming in. It looks good in a CB. They get people that go off to law school because of the skills that they actually learn. It's front facing. But those people are moving on as well. So the number of staff that can deal with clients come in. I asked her her numbers for the week before, and she said over 300 responses were made just in the air. That's phenomenal. I, I, I would imagine that you know the, the level of, I suppose, contact from to places like CAB 
is going through the roof. Absolutely. However, we ourselves as a redesign board really don't have any input into how, and maybe uh, Alistair would be better to answer this question uh -huh. than me, um, but it's, it's not something that we have a direct input uh, Well, into. they do get funding from They the, get funding the, from us, but that's, that's council, not, we're, we're, but not, we're not redesigning the funding. That's, yes. This is not for this, this process. Yes, but certainly but we, we cannot be involved in whatever a citizen's advice do to attract staff, etc. We're able to assist, but that's all yes. we can do. But, but more and, assistance. But also the service centre is only open from the wedding. Oh. It's a big issue. And also, only a Wednesday afternoon, the bus service does not always correlate with the opening times of the service. Like, you know, it's, the doors are needing to be open longer and staffed. I think you've heard Graham just uh, answer that question a few seconds ago. Yes, yes. Andrew? Yeah, I think the, the similar <coughs> issue that I've seen up in uh, Keith Ness is that as the uh, service centre hours have, have contracted, the number of people going to cabs has only increased. You know, if someone wants you know, advice, support or assistance, um, it goes somewhere. Uh, so you know, it's, it's in a roundabout uh, way. But I think the, the real big one here is the uh, customer engagement. Um, and there is a number of more, almost off-the-shelf solutions um, that you know, can help with this. I certainly know, um, you know Struan is, is um, last uh, role with PwC in their sort of GovTech unit. You know, that was, you know, still exists, specifically exists to link uh, public sector, private sector, you know, um, providers who offer these kind of things. And uh, predominantly, when it comes to uh, customer service, it is you know first thing you can do is always to try and reduce you know the number of needless calls and contacts to free up the people who do actually need to to make that and it, it seems that you know a, a bit odd that you know in in you know the 21st century that for many council functions the only way to get in touch with the council is by phone or in person at a service center mm -hmm. and you know there's many simple queries you could have answered by say a simple chat bot on a website there's pops up this little icon you type in your question and it can you know give your answer and you can remove a, you know a significant mm -hmm. number of needless contacts that only delay people through something as simple like that. So there's a, a lot of off-the-shelf solutions and uh, companies have you know, been through this process with other local authorities before. So it's um, something I think almost rather than trying to you know, reinvent the wheel ourselves, it's maybe something that we look at going external on. Point. Raymond. Uh, thanks, Convener. I'll just uh, try and get this camera of mine on. There we go. Yeah, I'm uh, hearing some of the points there in terms of the, the, the service points. Um, I think that's been raised uh, before at Council in terms of how Council should be approaching that. I'm glad to hear that Graham's uh, on the case with the um, Communities and Police uh, Committee and their staff. And uh, But uh, just a, a word, um, I spoke to Alison Clark and the staff here in uh, work at the service point. That service point's now been open um, full time. Um, or it certainly extend, very much extended hours um, because in in certain places, and that's why I think there, there might be, you know, uh, not a disconnect, but um, a, a difference in service provision from the service points uh, throughout the Highlands, depending on if service points are supporting the call system um, or not. Um, but here in Caithness, uh, the, they had the ability to be able to go into the DWP on a shared building uh, basis. And therefore, a lot of people were actually seeing the staff working behind the shutters and uh, just going across and approaching them. And the staff actually weren't turning them away. They were actually dealing with them, even though they were supposed to be shut. So the logical thing was to actually open the front doors and open up the shutters. And uh, that's what's happened. So um, the staff in uh, Caithness House here at the service point have been available on that basis for some time now. Tamala. Yeah, um, I've been contacted by constituents. Uh, first, uh, first and foremost, I'm not a member of the committee, but just as a uh, council, I'm just passing it through. Now, I've been contacted by constituents saying that the Highland Council website provides all incorrect numbers, contact details, and they have been passed from one end to the other. Uh, and it's been taking so long of their time. So it's something that we could look into and see if we can adjust, like, you know, get right numbers in the right places. 
that'll be great. Thank you. That's from me. Yeah, I'm sure we can do that. Thanks all. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you were looking at reviewing one of the projects I raised at um, Housing and Property about facility management and janitorial services, it's on page seven. And that, for me, that, and I know I'm not on your committee, that would be good to review that. No, that's fine. Um, and at page 11, when you talk about the lean projects, you, you do mention commercial waste, uh, fly tipping and uh, bulky outlets, but there's no mention of the uh, recycling facilities and their opening times. And just as Graham was going to say, you know, Alan and I, and I think we've all had a long conversation, and it's great of maybe solving some of these problems if the recycling centres were opened when people wanted to use them. Certainly, you know, some, some of the, the lean reviews are just part of a process. They're just to cut out the, the excess steps involved in every process. But if, if you want a deeper dive into some things, then that's also possible. It's not, a prerequisite is not having a lean review first. Miriam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just, is there any scope to work for some projects with NHS Highland? I'm thinking of Service Point and things like recycling blister packs. There are, it seems to me there's a, a logic of um, having blister pack collection, possibly in our service points, and doing that collaborative thing, uh, and be able to get other things. Viewers can probably link folks that the seven percent gases from landfill up in viewers and then go bits and bolts. So I, I just wonder if there's something to look at there, working with our public sector partners as well. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was looking at the customer engagement project. Um, th this is something that could um, expand quite big and, and overlap with other projects such as the asset management. Um, just because the, the digital aspect is really important and I think, yeah, we could do a lot with the website in terms of support tickets going, and, the, and the chat as well. But there are an awful lot of people who, who can't cope with that kind of digital part and still want the face-to-face -face and, and the telephone calls and things. So then we go back to maybe the community hubs and combine that with something else and use some of our assets that we've got. So it it, it could be a really big project, but I think we, we need to make sure we include absolutely everybody in it. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the things is, you know, let's just be brutally honest, our, our website is not the easiest to use. You know, if you're using the search facility on, a, on our website, then actually you're better off just Googling it. You get an answer a lot quicker. Um, so there are things that we need to progress with, but there's no doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for everybody's contributions. It's been really helpful. Um, I think just picking up on a, on a number of points on the on the customer engagement one, yes, it is much broader than looking at service points in the service centres. How um, people in Highland and anyone who wants to use our services is able to engage with us in a way that suits them best and causes us all less um, workload. So it's, it's the most efficient way. And the points you're making, Andrew, almost kind of would take the words out of my mouth because I, I was going to say pretty much what you were saying. This, this isn't about reinventing the wheel. This is about looking at what is actually quite established technology and a lot of other organisations that we're just not making use of ourselves. So there's going to be a very close connection with that digitisation process. But you're absolutely right, Jackie. It's, it's not about saying everybody needs to be channeled down a digitisation route. It's really important to say that customers can contact the council in a way that is appropriate for them. From my point of view, I want to do it when I'm at home, after work, might be the weekend, I might be sitting at home at 11 o'clock just doing my emails. That's my, that might be when I'm wanting to do my request for service. But somebody else, that's not going to suit them. They'll actually want to be able to pick up the phone. But what we don't want is for me to have to pick up the phone when I'm perfectly happy to do it online. Because every time I'm picking up the phone to call the service centre. I'm stopping someone who hasn't got an option from doing so. So it's really trying to get, the, as I say, those channels in the right place so that people know they're be the best way for them to get in, into contact with us. And then the lean reviews kind of fit in quite nicely with that because some of our processes are so clunky because they've grown organically over time. And what we need to do sometimes is take stock and say, okay, well, that's how it has become. 
because we didn't start with a clean sheet of paper. As I say, we've had the organic growth. That's charted, as Bill said, across the wall. These are all the processes. These are all the steps. These are all the handoffs. This is all non-value-added tasks, and we'll take all of those out until we find what we would do if we had a clean sheet of paper to start from. So it's all connected. Um, and, I think, and I think your point about connecting with asset management is a really good one of these community hubs. So I think all of that, I mean, all the points people made were really good. Um, I just wanted to make a point about uh, um, the tables on the back of both of the, um, of, of the reports. They are projects that have happened in the past. So, um, and then to draw your attention to, which I should have done in my introduction, my apologies, um, to the six, paragraph 6.1 under <coughs> item 6, which is a great focus on trying to track the benefits of the projects that we do. So we'll look back on the projects that we've done, but also we're going to start to move into on a new project and be really clear about how we're going to capture those benefits and make sure that they have done what we expected them to do. And if they haven't, why not? The other benefit of doing that is sometimes you think there's a fantastic project to do that seems really great to start off with. We have a good business case to set us going, but actually get partway down the track and say it's a non-starter. For whatever reason, sometimes we may call about maybe legally we can't do something that we thought we might be able to. If we're looking at benefits capture, then that tells us very early doors when it's to the point to say, okay, let's just draw a line under this. It's not going to happen. We're not going to keep on with it. We're going to stop it, park it, and start with something else. Because it is about being able to align our resources to the projects that are going to have greatest benefit for us. So that's why these two ones, the asset management, customer services are the two ones that we highlighted first. The customer service one, it's really important. It's not just about service points and service center. Very, really important because it's actually how we all deal with our customers. So myself, my my team, you know, right across the organization. So it's got to be really a holistic root and branch review about how we do that. And likewise, how you get to pursue your, your constituents, inquiries and requirements so that, again, you're only having to make contact once, not on numerous occasions. So it's a very, very big project, and when we do the business case, it will be about identifying what the work streams are, what the priority work streams are amongst those, and how we're going to take those forward. Okay. Members of three recommendations. Can we agree those recommendations? Agreed. Agreed. And we want to item seven. Mark. Mark. <coughs> Morning, members. Um, we've got about uh, 11 slides to just to give you an overview of asset management and uh, some of the things that we're looking to achieve, uh, and focusing on the opportunities on the way forward, what the future could look like, and some of the real benefits that uh, can derive to the council, all of the services, and uh, through a consequence of that uh, to the public as well. Now, this process originally started off as um, asset rationalisation. What came clear to us, and you'll see that as we go through the slides, hopefully, is it really is about a more holistic approach to how the council uses its assets in the round um, to its best benefit and also to the best benefit of the public. And so what we talk about here is a sort of strategic asset management approach, uh, and that is um, something that has a range of other activities sitting behind that, so things such as development, investment, and rationalisation are all work streams that sit behind the strategic asset management approach, as opposed to just thinking about what are we going to shut, because that's an important part of it, but it's very much a subset of that. So that's just to give you some uh, context. So these are some of the key things that we'll talk about as we go through uh, today's presentation. So there is uh, an update on what we're doing in relation to this uh, architectural wonder that is headquarters, I think is some way of describing it. In particular, about Block B. Um, so, what Block B is. Yeah. There. Thank you. Where Malcolm's pointing. Uh, so, the, the two blocks there with the Porter Cabins as well. So, we're looking at some options there to um, use some investment to create uh, an example of what a modern environment might mean. And that will give you an, an idea about what we'll be doing more generally uh, across uh, the HQ estate. 
We'll talk about some of the specific properties that we're looking to mothball as quickly as possible and give an indication on timelines for that, as well as moving to eventual disposal and rationalisation or realisation, I should say, of the actual cashable benefits towards that. We'll have a, a, a brief discussion about something which is actually a very exciting opportunity presented as a result of depot rationalisation in Inverness that actually links into uh, investment and development opportunities in the future and also will help the Council in terms of its ambitions to expand on service provision across pretty much every service actually um, that the Council operates. So that's a really big project and big opportunities there. And then finally, we'll give an example because a lot of members talk about this. <coughs> What you're doing yourself is fine. What you're doing with other stakeholders, public and private sector organisations, and that's about um, uh, what we're hoping to achieve in Portree, working with other uh, people. So as we pictured of <coughs> headquarters, um, we talked about Lockley over there as opportunities in relation to the old council building in Adros Street, for example, to move staff from there and to redevelop that into uh, housing. Um, so there's a clear opportunity uh, from that. Uh, the main block attached to where we're sitting here, uh, we're actually working through design proposals at the present time, which will involve effectively taking out anything that isn't a structural load-bearing wall or will uh, keep the building from falling over when the wind gets up. Um, in other words, opening it out to open plan as much as possible. A range of reasons. It's a more modern, it's a more flexible, it's a more efficient way of working as well. Uh, but actually, just as well as the um, use of office space itself and working in more modern ways, it also has a big cultural benefit from opening up space and having fewer people sitting in little rooms either on their own or with two or three colleagues. So there are a number of benefits that derive from that. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you start to see um, elements of that work um, already happening, even just in the outside area here and in the members' um, uh, uh, areas. That's the sort of first phase of us moving through what we're doing in the main block and also uh, in uh, block B uh, and in relation to uh, the Adros Street old buildings. So, as I mentioned, here are some of the things we are doing. We're going to have to stay <coughs> in headquarters for a period of time. I know there's been quite a lot of debate about that in the past, about whether we just get out of time completely and drop it. But uh, the most appropriate use of our resource at this point in time is to probably do the blended <coughs> we've been talking about. So we will shrink the footprint of headquarters effectively into where we are here and block attached over a period of time. But we will need blocks A and B in the short term as we rationalise out of other buildings across Inverness, for example. We need somewhere to have people go through uh, on the journey to uh, where their permanent location will be. Uh, but in the longer term, the vision is that we effectively just have these two uh, blocks and the rest will go over time. <coughs> So uh, that's what we've talked about in terms of block view. We've talked about the member areas and um, parking charges. I don't know if you want to make a quick mention about anything to that. Well, it says parking changes, changes not sorry. parking charges. <laughs> <laughs> parking changes, parking changes is the clear thing we've had. Quite a transformation in when people are coming into the office. Um, that car park strategically well located. So at the moment, we don't charge for car parking during the day for visit, uh, for tourists and uh, people who aren't using council buildings. Um, so the idea being we'll be able to make greater use of the asset, which is important for people going to Eden Court or going into town or whatever it might be. So we're not, this, is, this isn't um, suggesting charging staff for parking, but it is about getting rid of our restrictions because currently we don't charge between 10 and, and 4. Uh, it would just mean basically being able to charge for people who wanted to use the, the car park but weren't necessarily using this building. Um, and that'll help obviously with income, um, but it will also help with providing more parking choices throughout the city. And should have read the slide better. So this gives you an example of the sort of things <coughs> talking about. Uh, just some examples of um, other areas where um, open plan buildings um, exist. I suppose the concept around that, as much as the design element, this is also about how the space is actually used. So any of you that have been to Edinburgh Council's headquarters is open plan. There are no allocated spaces. If you want to sit in the same seat, you've always sat in you again early in the morning at 8 o'clock. You come in at 10, you might get lucky, you might not. Simple as that. And um, you know your belongings are effectively in an allocated locker. You go and get your stuff, you sit at your desk at the end of the day reverse the process. And there are very few people, I think only the chief exec and some of the directors actually have access to 
a bigger desk and or a private <coughs> office, but there are a range of different meeting spaces available for confidential uh, discussions and for, uh, meetings such as we have here. But the default principle is <coughs> open plan and non-owned space. You know, none of this, here's the sticker on the desk, I'm here every day from 10 to 3, that's not the way it will work going forward. That is going to involve some considerable change in the way that people are used to working and need some cultural change. Mm -hmm. um, but we do think that going forward in the future, if we have a desire to shrink our footprint and to work in a more modern way and to change the culture of the organisation, then that is all very much interlinked into this um, design uh, principle. So just to give you an idea of what we're looking at and hopefully that explanation will help uh, to sort of drive uh, or, or drive home uh, the reasons why we're, we're doing it. It's about use of space, but it's also about cultural change and becoming more efficient um, in the way that we do uh, business uh, as we go forward. So, uh, and uh, apologies, this has come out a little bit slower than I would um, like to, to have been, but I just want to sort of go over a couple of things in relation to the overview of this uh, project and where we've got to. Um, at the top, those two references to 2022, actually we commenced this process originally during summer 21, where it was as a rationalisation, but I've given them my introductory comments to explanation as to how we've moved the scale of the project on actually over that time, as a result actually of a lot of input from members to say actually it's a bigger piece than that, it's about strategic asset management. And in August of that uh, year, we had <coughs> redesign board and uh, through them then to the council, the initial batch of 16 properties, um, for uh, us to be able to uh, review the reads coming out of, uh, and I'll go over those, I'll show them in the next uh, slide. Um, we then had a bit of a pause about the approach that we wanted to take in relation to this, so we came back uh, initially with a discussion around the second batch of buildings uh, that we could take forward, but um, the view and uh, that, that emerged from that in discussion with members was actually probably what you need to do here is to take a more holistic approach rather than bringing things forward on a batched approach and say that if the principle accepted here is that we are coming out of buildings and rationalising buildings, then actually it's that holistic approach that we need to have approved rather than necessarily coming forward building by building going, what do you think about that? So that was approved um, in February uh, 2022 at the last time actually that we um, had a, a redesign uh, meeting. And so we've been working in the background since <coughs> on a list of options uh, that will help us to uh, realise not only um, ongoing revenue savings, but potentially um, uh, capital receipts, for example, as a result. Um, <coughs> a couple of things that's just worth highlighting. We talk about built environment assets and they have an awful lot of them, that's true to say. Um, but in terms of actually buildings that are occupied, either as habitable offices or as the space is used by people. Uh, it's probably less than 100 properties that are actually office or office similar types uh, with a couple of hundred schools attached on top. And for uh, some context, uh, the office footprint is about 13 to 14% of the floor space that we have of the whole council schools, around about 55 to 60%. The rest is a whole range of stuff, principally depots and uh, other uh, things. So it gives you an idea that when we're talking about use of space, this is why we talk about strategic asset management approach. It's actually about rationalising buildings, but it's changing the way in which we use some of those buildings. And so some of the points have been made earlier on, which are good points about actually the use of buildings as community hub schools is a really good example of that. So actually one of the options we look at is we may rationalise a number of buildings that staff actually work from, but make use of the school estate uh, where that is reasonable for other people to be able to uh, work from. So it's talking about maximising the use and the occupancy of a building in a way that is flexible to what the council is trying to achieve. And when we're looking at doing design and building of new schools, for example, then we can make passive provision in terms of the design because you simply bought on additional space, which can be used for a range of different reasons, service points, libraries, co-location of other uh, public and private sector organisations, etc. All of these things are possible. And so that's the kind of approach that we're uh, going to be looking at uh, going forward wherever possible. And indeed, we'll be taking that approach and seeing how well we can fit that into the existing um, estate. Um, <coughs> the priorities that we have from this, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we're trying to achieve a range of things, but we're definitely trying to achieve as quickly as possible ongoing revenue uh, budget savings, because uh, that will help with the um, financial position of the council. Uh, we will get some benefits from that in terms of capital receipts on sale of some of those assets, 
but as we'll talk about when we get to depots as well, uh, they will also um, give us a, an opportunity to be able to invest in the future as we go through. Talked about maximising use of existing building service, I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, what we'll be looking to do is to get out of expensive lease options as well, um, and also to prioritise um, either disposal or <coughs> um, community transfer where possible. And as you heard Donna say earlier on, one of the things that will help us to do that in the most efficient way forward is working closely with Deloitte, who have been uh, partnering us uh, in respect not only of our um, approach to uh, business planning and uh, uh, the like, but also in terms of helping us to uh, develop our approach to asset rationalisation and strategic asset management. And I had the first meeting with Deloitte as part of the kickoff of that process on Friday of last week. So it's very timely that we're here today um, to talk about that. Now, what that is going to mean in practice <coughs> is that coming forward, uh, we have an ambition uh, to come out of uh, buildings into moth bottom as quickly as possible. And this is an indication of the uh, batch one um, properties that I was talking about earlier on that originally uh, came forward and that have been approved for us to be able to take forward uh, in terms of uh, where we are moving staff from. And it's important to say that in, this does not mean buildings will close in every particular case. It's simply talking about how we as the council use those buildings uh, in a more different and a more flexible way. So some of you will have observed, for example, that Inverness Townhouse is on there. There are absolutely no proposals whatsoever to close that building. What we are saying is it's a more efficient use of that asset for the council and indeed for the common good for us to think about moving our staff from there to another location and then creating that opportunity uh, for the townhouse to then be able to maximise the benefit uh, for the people of Inverness and also for the common good in terms of how it uses that space then it's vacated by us um, to its benefit to um, actually grow its income if anything. Uh, so there are opportunities present as a result of us saving money by moving staff out. It creates an opportunity for them to uh, grow uh, in, uh, income as a result. So it's just to give you an indication that the important thing or the important principle which is just because you see something on it doesn't mean it's going to necessarily shut. We may change the way we use it as I described in terms of the townhouse, or we may change the way in which that asset is used more generally for other buildings. We may dispose of some, et cetera, et cetera. It does not mean in every case the building is going to shut. It's a really important point. I think people have that perception that you see it there, and that's the end of the building forever, and that's not the case in every example of it. So <clears throat> just to do a little bit in respect to the redesign proposal, I um, was telling you um, about um, the previous governance. Uh, this is through project board redesign. Uh, and uh, some of the challenges that we had about um, the uh, timeline uh, for uh, delivery. So we're looking to mothball as many buildings, for example, as we can reasonably achieve uh, by December of this year. And uh, that's uh, going to be uh, challenging, but nonetheless, that's us moving into the logistics of delivery, as opposed to talking about the theory of how we might actually do some of these things. So by the time we come back to the next uh, redesign uh, uh, meeting, then uh, we will be reporting on how we have progressed uh, in terms of that uh, ambition. Uh, and as far as um, the rest of that is concerned, I talked earlier on actually about the impact that members have had on this, and one of the clearest impacts on that has actually been moving us away from just talking about rationalisation to the strategic asset management approach, and actually moving away from saying let's do it by batches to let's do it in a holistic way. So it's a good example of redesign having had a massive uh, Im impact on uh, the development of this um, project. The proposal just below <coughs> says about how we do this from an officer perspective. So there's a strategic property board, which I chair, um, that um, meets fortnightly and looks at the logistics of how we um, start to rationalise and come out uh, of these buildings up to a certain value. Um, at a higher value, um, that is dealt with or will be dealt with through the Housing Property Committee. Um, all properties with a common good interest have to go to council. Uh, so that will not be decided by me and will not be through housing and property. Um, and we will continue to meet with a range of members that have got an interest on this, either strategically or on a local basis, as we are um, actively engaging with members uh, through um, their board business meetings. And uh, indeed, we've had two or three uh, of those already, and we'll be rolling that out more as we go through this process, saying this is actually what it means in terms of you and where you <coughs> stay. And much of that is just <coughs> um, summarised um, here. So we're looking at um, headquarters and uh, Jamie as buildings that um, can be relatively easily rationalised as well. We talked about that earlier on in terms of the old part of headquarters and Androstry. 
we've got the key uh, top five or ten targets that can come out of as quickly as possible. Actually, we're hopeful that we may be able to deliver more on that, but uh, we're just working our way through the logistics of that at the present time. Uh, we'll be making the decisions ultimately through the design board. That's what we're here today to talk about the overarching approach and uh, some of the detail I've talked about. Um, we will be and we are continuing to um, work uh, with those teams that will be affected um, to try and give them the best alternative to the locations in which they are in at the present time and talking with them about, as far as is practically possible, what the shape of these alternative spaces will look like. As I've underlined, this is us moving into the logistics side of things as opposed to necessarily um, uh, uh, starting a, a consultant process. So there will be an element of staff moves being required and as I said, um, mothballing, dispose, demolish, repurpose. That's where our head's at at the present time. Maybe please know there's only a couple more slides um, left, uh, and I'm going to talk briefly on depot rationalisation. First of all, I'll probably ask Malcolm as well, because he's got an interest in this to, uh, to make some uh, detailed comments. But this is a good example of a really exciting opportunity that's presented itself as a result of a set of significant challenges. So. Um, depots, as many people know, are challenging in terms of their conditions. The details are all up there. Uh, the impact actually within Inverness is up there. And actually, we've got some particular challenges. Uh, we've got a desire to uh, acquire some buses. We are building lots of houses across Inverness, for which there will be a requirement for additional waste, for example, trucks to be uh, procured. There's the opportunity to expand out on um, housing and um, building maintenance, for example, bringing more of that in-house. All of these things require extra footprints of <coughs> make it viable for us to be able to achieve all of these things and indeed in terms of some of our net zero so places to store hydrogen for example as we move to hydrogen for HGVs and <coughs> electric vehicles generally so <coughs> we're doing some feasibility uh, work uh, in relation to that at the present time what might a sensible site like look, look like what are the planning issues that are uh, surrounding that uh, and we're also looking at um, how we may be able to attract external funding to that, but obviously linked to that if we rationalise the other existing estates within Vaness, are uh, development opportunities which are actually quite exciting. So we may be able to redevelop some of those existing sites for housing, something we might want to choose to do ourselves, depending on what our levels of ambition or attitude to risk is, or it might be something that we just simply say, you know what, it's not for us, and we sell it and we get a capital receipt in. All of these things are options. Marco, I don't know if you want to chip in anything in relation to all of it. No, I think the <clears throat> bottom line is Longman, uh, we've got three sites currently at uh, in the Longman Industrial Estate and then Dirrybacht. Um, the three, you know, Longman Industrial Estate is one of the areas that has retained very high land values. Um, but we've also got to be honest and say our depots are not the best working environment for, for people and do need work. So, you know, whether it's in terms of fire risk or whether it's just in terms of general maintenance. So we're taking the opportunity to say, is that a business case here to rationalise from the four, but actually it could be more with smaller buildings that could be wrapped into it. Um, so just to give you an idea, Dirty Buck Depot, the Trading Standards Building on, on Harbour Road, the library support unit um, down in Longman, Lawton Street, and then there'll be various little parcels that, that we might also be able to bind into that. Basically, the question that I hope you'll support asking today is, is there a business case for, for us to um, combine all of our depot um, requirements in one place? Um, and you know, then we'll at least know the answer, and we won't keep coming back to it. Uh, and we'll have a, an idea of the quantum, you know, of investment required. And obviously, there's a huge opportunity for us as, as we're moving into the, the net zero world uh, to bid for um, any available funding for that. So it's really, you know, I think it's just one of these things that's frustrated us all uh, as we keep coming to the question and not getting past the question. So the idea is, let's ask a question, but let's get the answer. I think, Malcolm, you, you meant one depot in Inverness. You didn't mean one depot throughout that. <laughs> one depot in Inverness. Yes. Thank, you, thank you very much for that clarification, Chair. <laughs> so it, it is a good example of, a, of, a, of an opportunity uh, that's arisen as a result of a serious challenge. And um, 
would be looking to try and get that outline business case developed as quickly as possible. Um, so in the final slide, I just want to talk a little bit about co-location because it's also a question that's asked of us uh, quite often. Um, and it isn't just about the council looking internally only to itself. So, for example, people within my own service are in regular communication and have regular meetings with uh, NHS Highland, for example, to look at these co-location uh, opportunities. Policing colleagues are coming uh, on board. Sometimes some of the challenges around that is that different organisations are at different parts of their investment loop and are coming out of leases at various different times, so there isn't always necessarily uh, that, um, that, that ability for everybody to move at the same pace and within the same time frame. But nonetheless, we're all signed up to that concept. There's no reason why we can't co-locate with voluntary sector partners. There's absolutely no reason why we can't have shared space within buildings with any other organisation uh, within certain boundaries. Uh, but you know, the concept of sharing space and having shared responsibility for um, the, those spaces is, is well established. And this just gives you some examples about what's going on uh, in Portree uh, and in particular and I'm going to check it out and just describe it as our office in Portree. I don't want to <laughs> absolutely hammer the pronunciation or get a kick from my side here. Um, but we are looking at the state of that building and whether or not we can use that for alternative purposes or whether it might be redeveloped, where we might be able to relocate within the space that we have elsewhere within Portree. So, for example, a high school is an example where there may be opportunities um, to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, around um, depots, ambulance, fire, we might have as well. Uh, New um, requirements. I don't know if you want to. No, no, only to say, Councillor Rowe will also kick me, but because I've got a Lewis pronunciation. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, but but the the bottom line here is the timing is really good on this because this has happened. It's been kicked off. There's uh, Scottish Future Trust are involved. There's 14 public sector organisations have property in Portree. 14. So I think that if we can get a bit of oomph behind us. Um, and get you know the board on board. Um, you know the timing is probably right because again there's also opportunities for funding um, as part of the government's um, place program, um, at least to just drive things along. And, and whether it's um, you know ideally it'll be about reusing existing space um, as, as much as we can um, and. I would say there's really good buy-in, particularly from HIE, from Police Scotland, uh, from Fire Service and from the Ambulance Service, because they've all got their individual needs and requirements. So I just think it's a really, it's probably a, a, a perfect timing for, for this one. But just to make sure that the, the North is not forgotten about, there is a similar project which is still in germination stage uh, happening up in uh, Caithness. And again, if, if we can roll these things together, we can hopefully come up with um, outcomes that will support you know, what we're trying to do here in terms of asset management. So that brings us to um, the close of our, of our presentation. Member, thanks for bearing with us while we went through that, and um, hopefully you found something of some interest in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Welcome. Members, any point? Um, any members? Uh, Trish? Just one thing about if we're sharing space at the schools with various other organisations, we've spent a lot of time and effort to make the schools secure. So I wonder about certain individuals having to access the other services that may not we may not want on the school premises. I think it's a, a perfectly fair point. Nothing that we would do in relation to shared usage of, of spaces within schools could in any way impact on. Uh, the safety of um, pupils or teachers or other people with legitimate business in the school site. So we're talking at a top line principle of being able to use schools as, scare, as shared spaces, but that's absolutely front and central of, of what we would be thinking about um, when we're thinking about various different models and options. Some of that to a certain extent can be dealt with by how we physically design buildings or convert them, but I, I absolutely take that point of board as a, a point fairly made. Thanks. Paul. I only have one point to make, but I've got loads now. Um, so I'll try and talk quick. Um, tying this back to redesign board, and we're talking about reunification, and it's mentioned through the, the papers that have been provided, talking about staff. You need to speak to staff 
you know, use an example, Ardross Street, you've mentioned that already. Social work team were taken out of Ardross Street and put into the old part of the HQ. Wasn't fit for purpose. You look at um, health visitors just now in Doctor Drive. You need to consider all of their work is on paper format. So again, looking at this holistic approach shouldn't mean it's a quick win. And that's what our dross was. Our dross was a quick win. Get them out, get the building sold. Um, HQ, open plan. I thought we were doing that as part of the new ways of working project because that's what we were told. That was two years ago. Open plan, bit of spend to save, uh, update the air conditioning. We should have been doing that already, not two years later. Um, looking at selling properties, cheeky question. Are we selling it as market value? Or are we just offloading? Again, I'll use an example. Probably three years ago, there was a bit of open space. I'm sure it was up at Kodatho. Sold it off, cheap as chips, and a developer came in and built flats in it, made thousands. But we sold it off. I remember it was an article in the Courier. So I'm sure I could dig that one up. And then my ears pricked up when you mentioned um, depots. And I don't know if it's too late to declare an interest check. Um, but in my job within the council, I work on Lockman Street. And <laughs> yeah, there's the recycling centre there. There is roads, there's waste, there's amenities. Look at Derry Buck. Look what happened with Derry Buck when we tried to redevelop Derry Buck. We sold that piece of land down by the road to Mr. Arnold Clark, made thousands of it, <coughs> but it cost us £600,000 at the last count, and it took us three years to get that developed. So I have serious concerns when we talk about super depots. We talked about a super depot at Wick. That was years ago. That was 2015. We talked about that. That's seven years ago. If we're looking at a super depot now in Inverness, we missed out, I believe, on the old college open space when that got knocked down. I think we were given an opportunity to buy that and build a new HQ building. You seem a lot of shaking our heads. I'll, I'll take Donna first. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I can come in here because I think what I said earlier is this needs a business case approach. And um, we've got to like work alongside. They've already had presentations on this. There's a couple of things here that we've got to learn from new ways of working, we've got to learn from where we are now. We can't afford the cost of the problems we've got. Every organisation around about us is having to take urgent action. We have done a lot of consultation um, on a number of these buildings. Some of the asks from staff are not deliverable, not affordable. Um, what we need to do with this, and you're absolutely right, uh, Paul, is engage with staff. So. In terms of after today, um, you know, Mark and Malcolm have sat down with a business cases approach. We need to directly engage. Mark, Malcolm and I are going to do that on a weekly basis with a commitment to this because to, we can't be sitting here in a year's time with no progress. And in some of the consultation processes with staff and learning from new ways of working, we have to be more uh, quick, agile, direct and honest with our staff about what we can and cannot afford uh, in the current environment. So. There's going to be a weekly engagement in these buildings with staff with a go back for next week because actually we need to do our business differently. And the way we've been doing it, it's just not quick enough, it's not fast enough, and that, that just creates the stress for staff as well. I think so <coughs> we'd rather have an honest approach for them with what's doable. Um, we looked at, for example, at parts of this building and costs came back at thousands and thousands. The public are not going to accept that just now, and I can't accept that in terms of some of the challenges that we face, but what you've got a commitment of a weekly direct engagement process because it is about going back to staff. But you've got an absolute assurance that there has to be a business case behind us. Is that a cat? Is it repurposing? Is you know, mm -hmm. what are the options? And then the decision making about that business case. But there is a bit here about getting these buildings lost ball so we can make decisions so we can actually make progress at the kind of pace that other organisations do and we haven't done that uh, in the last year so uh, in terms of consultation and yeah in terms of some of these specific sites and and we can get that in writing to people so they understand but we have we did make progress to acquire certain sites um, and even in the last council 
people will note this, that we have gone forward commercially on some sites and purchases. Um, but however, in terms of business cases against them, then they change quite dramatically um, during COVID in terms of what the outcomes for that were in terms of values. But we're happy we can deal with that confidentially in terms of members. Uh, but we'll have to check the commerciality aspect of that, Chair. Welcome. Yeah, just on, on the depots, I, 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 I totally appreciate what you're saying, but equally, as you know, the, the, uh, the conditions of the older parts of these these uh, locations are, are not great, and I think we, we recognise that. The traffic management, you know, the fleet's keeping, is continuing to grow. There are more and more precious things like EV charging points are needed, and, you know, the reality is space is an issue. So mm -hmm. um, the, the idea behind this is let's at least look at what the business case might look like and make sure it's done with the involvement of all of the, you know, the occupiers in terms of real space requirements. So at least we've got it spelled out. The college site, the reality is that that site isn't big enough anyway, you know, to be blunt. Uh, you know, it's, it's just not big enough for the, the if you were taking four uh, depots and putting them all together. I was, wasn't mentioning this new HQ building. You're talking about co-locating the fire brigade. You've got the court, so the justice centre right beside it. HQ, you could have the ambulance service come Well, we're not talking about relocating this building. You know, there, there is no possible way that, that we can afford or the public would accept us building a brand new edifice in, in Inverness. So, so let's be honest. What I, what I was going to come on to, though, was the one site we are, which does offer potential and is part of our city region deal um, scheme, you know, is down at the Longman, which is perfectly located uh, in terms of accessibility. And that's certainly the first one that jumps out at me as offering us the real potential to do something transformational because it ties into everything else. And, and as you may be aware, we're looking at the hydrogen possibilities uh, down in that area as well as part of that. So, you know, I'm an optimist and I always think that, you know, things collide together right at the right time. So, you know, I think we should be working towards at least looking to see where the business case will maybe we stack up and there might be an opportunity to get another, get, get another funding, funding on that. And just on the, everyone has their space requirements. I get it all the time, even when I'm talking to the folk in Block B. Uh, we've gone totally online and planning and building standards, for example, so there's nowhere near the amount of um, paper requirements we've got, but I recognise that's not the same. But when I'm talking to people up in Block B, they want to see it improved because they do recognise it's inefficient. You know, 38% occupancy during, during the, the week, much lower on some days than others. Mm. The, the simple fact is that when I was speaking to folk uh, yesterday up there, they were saying, well, we, we'll do it ourselves. And, and that's fine, great, go for it. But if you're still using the existing desks with the big space requirements, you know, we've got to rationalise the space even within the building. And that is exactly what, you know, modern organisations do, in, in my in my opinion. Um, so so that, was, that was that one. And I think we will get the point where, you know, if, if we look at our draw street, which is the old building further over, so the one you were referring to, um, in terms of heat, heating costs, that is a big user for the HQ state. In terms of rates, if we can turn, if we can multiple that building and come up with a scheme that will take it out, will make it a domestic use, i.e. meet part of our housing need, then that is going to save this, just this tiny part of our overall estate, significant sums of money. And I, I really feel that in my, in my discussions with people, you know, they do realise we are very traditional in our work format. Um, in, in HQ. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful we can co-design it. So it's not seen as being done to people, it's actually co-designed. It's just that everyone won't get exactly what they want, but hopefully they'll get enough of what they want. It's good to hear you're an optimist, Malcolm. I always thought you were from Lewis. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest part. Oh, I'm getting into that. Uh, only a very minor point on that, it, as well as the <coughs> as well as the business efficiency argument for co-locating four depots into one, the thing that's equally as important to that is actually providing decent working conditions for people that have for a very long time had to put up with. And you know this yourself, because we've talked about this as well, 
you know, it's, it's dealing with that aspect of it as well. So it's, it's very much in my mind as much about all those exciting opportunities. It helps us to fix some of those particular challenges about health and safety and just poor working conditions which have persisted for, for too long. So I, I see that as one of the sort of key drivers for this, as well as all the beneficial opportunities that Malcolm's uh, uh, very aptly um, described to you just now. Yeah, I think when I saw, uh, first of all, uh, spend to save on Block B, I, I was a bit disappointed to see that it didn't involve dynamite. I think that would be the, the biggest spend to save we get there. But, um, um, and it was, it's interesting to hear what you're saying about uh, you know, using Block B as, as a way, as a halfway house to begin to rationalise the estate and then, you know, uh, you get rid of that as part of a, a stepping down. And it, it did make me go back to one of uh, Councillor McPherson's many pleas over the last five years on how to utilise the janitor's houses. Um, and it would seem to me that, you know, particularly on the east side of the city, you've got a lot that, that are just empty. And there's two in Clodden Academy alone. And the footprint... Have they? They've gone. Have they? Well, um, I mean, you still, you still look around Duncan Forbes and a lot of the older schools, you have these. And they are, you know, roughly the size of, sort of these two rooms here. Mm -hmm. And you think we've got empty buildings about this size. You know, how many desks could you fit into, into that? I mean, you have you know, a number of these around the outskirts of, of the city. How many say, car journeys could you reduce from people's homes into HQ by having you know, some hot desks uh, you know, round about there? And it could be hot desks or even you, if you're looking at in a school estate, maybe having you know, some of the education function there. But it would seem, you know, you've got these small buildings. Um, you know, is it economic, you know, are small buildings economic to use in that way or is, you know, one big the, the better? Uh, I mean, for, for the townhouse, I mean, I, I always thought the best way to, to deal with that for the Common Good Fund would be to turn the, the top story into executive flats and Airbnb the hell out of it. Um, and then that, that gives you accommodation for a function. You could let the whole thing out um, for weddings and whatnot. Um, I can imagine it would be a, a very uh, heavily utilised because it's, it's really something like that's the only way you can make money from that. Uh, and in terms of our, our draw streets, going back to I think there's a debate we had in the first year of redesign um, where we were looking at, you know, could you build almost a hotel that you would have available for members to reduce the, the, the travel? And on any sort of full council or committee day, half of our draw street B&Bs are packed out with, with members already. Um, and you know, the, the housing issue in across the Highlands isn't just lack of housing. Uh, it's exacerbated by the likes of the Airbnb because there's also a lack of tourist accommodation. And um, you know, de facto, if you create more tourist accommodation, you in a roundabout way will hopefully prevent you know, more residential homes disappearing um, out of domestic use. Um, so I think it would be a shame just to, you know, just think of, you know, housing only when there is also a need for, uh, you know, tourist accommodation. So you could, you know, again, turn something like uh, uh, our draw streets into, you know, an apart hotel, so, you know, studio flats or something, um, which can make revenue, but you, know, you can also have, uh, you know, space, to, you know, dedicated to members throughout the week. Uh, which you know will ultimately save money because I don't think any council was able to get a, a hotel in the city, um, you know, under 100, 150 pounds a night um, over the summer. So uh, I think you, you, you think you know a bit bigger picture. What else we can do because um, something that can generate income is always uh, more than welcome. Doctor, please can you turn the camera off? Thank you. Yeah. And Andrew, yeah, you make some good points, and, and there will be options for these buildings. But, but I think the one thing that we really have to get our head around, we need to get out of these buildings before yeah. we can do anything with them. So you make a very good point. Um, no other members of the committee? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a very quick question about the, the depots. Um, taking into account the logistics and, and the staff who work there. Is there a reason why they need to be in Inverness, actually? Are, are there any assets out within Inverness that could be changed into more of a sort of super depot? I, mean, I think we're, we're happy to look at the whole question around depots and um, how we might take them forward in the future and how Martin talked about opportunities that we're looking at um, elsewhere. So I've got, um, <coughs> as part of this process, be more than happy to look at whether or not that might mean that not every function is necessarily currently located in the four MS depots 
needs to go into, uh, for example, for the long, uh, long run. So we can pick that up as a as a part of that process and consider the point about whether or not any of those services may be able to be delivered from elsewhere. Indeed, um, staff uh, work from elsewhere as part of that um, process. And that be something that we pick up as part of the general discussions that we um, have as we take that project forward. So that's yeah, a fair point. Members, you'll need to be patient because um, if, if you're not a member of the committee, I will take you, but I'm going to take committee members first. Mm -hmm. Carl? I think uh, what Mark's saying there about what creating open plan spaces is really what we're talking about is um, removing the silos, the little rooms we sit in one at a time, two at a time, and that's what I'm picking up here is really the, the mission of this board is to break down silos across Highland Council. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I was I think on the re redesign board for the past two years, and uh, because it was done remotely, I really didn't make much impression on me. It's just so good to, to be in a room, and it, this all makes sense. But what I think we're looking at here from Mark and Mark is a, is a high level approach or a high level discussion today, and really, I think we should be just getting right behind this. Uh, we should be harnessing Malcolm's optimism and not just asking a question, but answering a question and doing something. Angela. Thank you, Chair. Um, I liked the idea of the co-location and working together. When the Chief Executive first came to Highland, she had meetings in different areas of the Council and she got members of the different services to come along and share their experience, what their issues were. And I think it was good in that each of the different services got to understand the pressures that the other services were under and realised that they all actually work for one Highland Council. Um, and, and that was that part of the talking again. Oh, good, good, good. Um, and, and that did work well. So I, I think this, this suggestion of uh, all working from one office will, will work and, and help. The other questions, when the slide was up for phase one, I wasn't sure if they were all leased buildings or maybe <coughs> some of them were owned. And are you looking at perhaps who uses the building? For instance, in the one in Dingwall, um, that's used by um, criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And so you probably wouldn't want them next to your school or your grand, you know, whatever you're going to move them. So are you looking at that, that as well? Um, Depots, I, I think that's a really good um, idea um, to view them. I, I, go, I go around at the depots in my ward and I'm, I'm in and out of buildings all over the place and I would absolutely agree with what Mark says. A lot of the staff don't have the facilities that they should have and um, while pay is decided at a national level, the facilities that you provide for your staff is something that we do have, um, you know, we are able to influence and we should be providing them the best facilities we possibly can, especially if you're in a little port cabin and you've got a little heater under your, you know, under your table to try and warm you up. So I think that's something that positive that should come out of this. What I wasn't clear on... Excuse me a minute, what we did? Uh, I was asked to disconnect this. Do not disconnect, disconnect that because there's people still on the screen. No, I'm only disconnecting that. Right, okay, so Raymond on. asked if the presentation could be taken down because he can't see everybody. Raymond didn't say anything. Sorry, nothing to do with me. I'm on it and I can see everybody. Yeah. Somebody. So the other thing I wondered about with your mothballing buildings, how long will they be mothballed for? Um, because you will still be paying rates, and Malcolm touched on that, and we have buildings in our ward that maybe have been emptied a while. Highland Highlands have moved out of one of the buildings, the old library in Dingle, but there's nobody else in it. And so once you've moved out, what is the process? I saw the slide saying communities could ask for them. What is the process and how will communities know what that process is? That's you know, when, when will that all be worked through? And the other, uh, I know you had Inverness Townhouse, but there are others that, um, that are common good assets. How will they be treated? Will they be treated the same or differently from, from the <coughs> council buildings? That's my question. Thank you. 
Chris Ballins, you still there, Chris? Yes, I am. Yes, sorry, took a moment to get round to the microphone. Um, a different question, well, a couple of questions. Well. Inverness, well, Inverness Townhouse, you mentioned the possibility of moving everybody out to generate income from it, and I wondered whether you've had any thoughts as to how it would generate income. Um, I mean, it's, it's something that I would support, but I just wonder what the thinking is. And my second question is, what sort of timescale are you thinking about for that and also for the HQ works? Thank you. Um, Drew? Drew Miller? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, yeah, I found it quite interesting being, being back listening to uh, this, uh, the, this uh, redesign board and certainly welcome um, the, the comments were made about uh, the speeding up of disposal of uh, buildings that were declared surface uh, and you know, and also uh, mothballed buildings. Uh, you know, we have two at the moment, two schools in Sky that are, are mothballed, but we have to obviously box clever uh, uh, how we how we dispose of these. But certainly I think there seems to be some blockages in the system where when local communities wish to maybe lease them short term in the meantime to make sure that they're at least maintained and used uh, rather than being left to just fall into disrepair and then when the time comes to sell them uh, they're worthless so I think we we I would welcome that the whole system is going to be hopefully speeded up uh, to do that uh, by the way I, I can't see any of these speaking because I have a, a screen there with a, a, a TV screen switched off and a big X, X, red X on it. So whatever's wrong with my system. I, I really was particularly interested in, uh, though, um, I'm sorry to sort of move away from Inverness for a moment, but the, the last slide about the, the working with the public sector co-locations in, uh, in Portree, I think uh, most people would agree that the future of Taina is uh, it certainly should be looked at. It's, it's a bit of a warren of offices and what, three three floors up. Um, it's it's not really an ideal modern building suitable for uh, for the the uses that it's in at the moment. And I think it would certainly be welcomed by most people at a co location and working with with other agencies. I, I think it's probably must be at least fifteen years ago. Uh, certainly between ten and fifteen, when the the fire service, the police service, were all looking at at co locating and the ambulance service. Uh, out with uh, their present locations, and uh, I think that's again something that would be welcomed by by certainly I would have thought the majority of people connected with with those services, um, and I, I would certainly welcome some discussion uh, at at area level, which is our ward level, uh, about about that uh, that whole scenario. I mean, there's there is plenty of land available uh, round about Pritchie that a brand new custom. Uh, sort of customised building that would accommodate the police, the fire and some of the council staff. There's plenty of land available there. Um, and regarding making better use of the, of the, for example, the school, uh, I think at the moment we obviously with the Gaelic school, the Gaelic department are, are operating out of the school. So I don't see any reason why some uh, services perhaps slightly uh, connected to to education couldn't be perhaps utilising uh, some spaces within the high school because as the school role is falling there must be some spaces becoming available there but I would love really welcome uh, uh, some as soon as possible some uh, discussion at the uh, at ward level with with the officers just to see how we can we can move this thing forward sooner rather than later and I mean the key to it all of course is the for the movement out of out with Portree of course is the is the link road which I believe is coming up for planning fairly soon and hopefully that will be started within the next probably well certainly within the next 12 months perhaps even completed so there's there's plenty of opportunities so as I say I'd welcome a chance to have a chat with the officers thank you thank you very much for allowing yeah, you us you don't need to worry, Drew. We, we can see you perfectly well, including that background of, uh, of what is it, Celtic Park? <laughs> I think you should is start it? taking. I think you should start taking oh, the medicine wow. again, Chairman. I think that's the new football stadium. I think that's the new football stadium he's purchased. 
Well, it's I, a nice that's the building that's proposed to be bought for. <laughs> Very good. It's not the moment. Yeah, they can't see the ones. Online attendees can't see us. So Rose is just going to change the, the settings so okay. that it's back into the room and away from the Right, carry on, Rose. Well, they could have come here if they wanted to see us. That's very good. Oh, no. Can you put it back to the blank screen, please? Uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Just just think of the money we're saving the council by doing this remotely. Derek. Derek Loudon. No Derek Loudon. Muriel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark and Mark. There's an awful lot going on there. One of my concerns is that can you manage to fit in the buildings that are lying uh, that were costing heating and just keeping them yeah, thanks. I think what this discussion is showing is just how complex this all is. It's very easy to say we'll, we'll do this with a building, but it's a knock-on effect on staff and I, and I don't think we're looking at this uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that's new. I think we're tending to do it in a way we've always done it. You know, for instance, for depots, we're not the only people that have depots. You know, it's not just public services. There's lots of private people have a lot of vans, a lot of depots, and maybe it's an opportunity to do something a little bit wider than we've done before um, that can actually utilise things. I think the other thing we've got to do is start looking at things that are, we've said we can't touch before. You know, we've got 300 schools. It'd be much easier for some people to go into a school to work than come into a building here, try to find a table, sit down, only to find they haven't got everything they need. So we've got to look at the schools, and that creates several other problems. What to do about safeguarding, what to do about PVG checks. So that sets up a whole different strand or theme of work that needs to be carried out. But I think the key, key thing here is we've talked about some of this for an awful long time now. We've talked about the townhouse for gosh, the whole length of the previous administration, just about, we should get on and do it. Because the savings of the council is, is, is the rent. The Common Good Fund with the cast of developments has got loads of opportunities and things it can explore. But I think it's pace and urgency that are needed around this and not, and not talk now. So I think it'd be interesting to understand what the business cases are for each of these. Take the, the, the big ticket items first and not, not the wee janitor's house in the middle of nowhere. Take the big ticket items first and get them done. But one thing I've been curious about, Deloitte has been mentioned a couple of times, be interesting perhaps in the next meeting to have reported to what the terms of reference are for the engagement of Deloitte, what Deloitte are offering us, how much Deloitte are charging us, uh, what we can get out of it, and the cost-benefit analysis, because these people might give you, <laughs> I used to work for them, these people might uh, give you the first one, two, three visits free, and then they come in with four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, you know, charging pretty heavy fees. So it'd be interesting to understand exactly what the, the contractual relation are over Deloitte. Was it a level that had to be tendered or not? Just to make sure we're doing everything, you know, the, the way we should be. But I think the key to this is just to get on and do it. I think you make a really good point, Alistair. It is high time we just go on and did this. Mm -hmm. Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Duncan, Thank you for allowing me to speak. Yep. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm not a member of your committee. Um, yeah, very interesting discussion. And um, I think I'm heartened by what I've heard today about all the, the change of uses and, and multiple uses. Um, but also to add on that yesterday on the news, we heard that the banks were looking at opening banking hubs. And I think the suggestion that we, we look to utilise with other partner agencies, the likes of uh, fire and police, whatever possible, and creating hubs. But I think better use of our resources. Um, and COVID has brought this about, and but it's a great opportunity for us as well and great savings can be made. So, uh, yep, yeah, thank you. And that was all I wanted to add. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Doug. Gentlemen, you have, uh, and then I'll let Donna wind up at the end. Thanks. Just to pick up on a few points that have been made around <coughs> use of schools um, generally, uh, and I sort of partially answered this in relation to uh, Anshin Trish's point earlier on, um, that 
you're right to highlight that we need to be careful about some of these proposed uses of, uh, of buildings and where and whom it would be appropriate to co-locate on school sites. So it's not a universal panacea to the problem, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Um, I think at a top line level, the concept is one that is worth exploring, but the overarching principle has to be about making sure that those um, schools at all times are a safe environment for children principally and teachers and allied staff and other uh, users to those buildings. So nothing that we do in any respect in, uh, in relation to schools will do anything to uh, reduce um, the importance of that. Um, I know um, there was some discussion about um, mothballing um, and actually what are you going to do with that and kind of these stuff standing forever. I'm, I'm reminded when I was over in Sky the last time um, I went to uh, UIC and uh, saw the state of the old primary school there which had just effectively been left to rot for several years. There's no other way of deciding it past any um, economic use or any purpose in actually um, remodelling it or reinvesting in it. Uh, and so what I think is actually a point well made is if we're mothballing it, then we need to take the decision as soon as practically possible thereafter. What are you going to do with it in the future? Blow it up, remodel it, sell it, etc., etc. Can you just leave buildings to uh, to rot? Uh, so that's the point I'm absolutely um, well made. Um, I talked before, there's been a lot of talk about co-location opportunities. That is very much um, something that we are exploring, just a challenge sometimes with public sector, as is all actually being in the same place at the same time in terms of our investment cycles, uh, but actually also in some cases about the ability at a local level for some of these organisations to take those decisions. So if you speak to Police Scotland, for example, the minute say, can you do anything unless Glasgow says yes? Right, that is a challenge sometimes. Um, but we can try to work our way around that um, in uh, a more strategic way. It might be that we need to have work with the Scottish Government, for example, about how we can actually take opportunities like poetry and not get sort of held up by the fact that all of the decisions are taken elsewhere and essentially look at the opportunities that might present as a, a pathfinder kind of approach to uh, break the back of some of these challenges and actually enable us to explore those opportunities more quickly. Um, I think um, the other side of that, um, yes, there's talk about um, how we can uh, generate income in relation to uh, Inverness Townhouse if we move out. I think it actually creates a big opportunity for the townhouse to as much as anything else. Uh, so I, I uh, hope to see that as a problem. Um, I think um, that's pretty much all the comments um, I wanted to make. Don't know if I'm anything else there. But, but however, the, the income from the Inverness Townhouse is, will be a matter for the Common Good Fund to decide. Yes. And exactly. not for this redesign board. Well, no. uh, nothing further. Thank you very much for the input. It's been really useful. Sarah. Sarah. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this. I, I think that the, the, the point I was going to make has just been covered, but uh, just to reinforce that I would welcome personally uh, access to schools, particularly in uh, far areas uh, like the peninsula when I'm there doing some work sometimes just for an hour. I'm two hours from Inverness, two hours from home, and I would really welcome having access to a school where I could go and sit down and carry on with my work uh, uh, as a, as a counsellor. Thank you. Andrew. It was just a, another point to make, just following on uh, what Alistair was saying about you know, how we need to look at this and not just the same way as we always have. Um, as you maybe think that you know, we've, we've talked about you know, what the opportunities on our estate are and how you know, what partners you know, we can bring into that. But you know, what about you know, going out to you know, the same partners to see what they have? You know, for example, you've got the old police HQ um, at Inches. It is half empty since it's, it's been uh, I think we're actually doing that, Andrew, yeah. and, and you're right, that, that particular building we talked about you know, a long time ago, yeah. w would it be an acceptable building if that we could move into? Yeah. So there are a lot of these projects going on, yeah. uh, but that's certainly... But I, I think you know, we, we spent, you know, as Paul said, about two years talking about some of these projects, that there's some that are quick, easy wins, like you could turn all of that into open space and move at the townhouse in about three months. You know, so you know, th that's a quick, easy one. Let's just do it. Oh. Yeah, you know, I think in summary, folks, it's, let's just make this happen. Um, let's do it. Uh, staff need it to happen. Um, firstly, in terms of school consultation, we met with head teachers in the chamber a couple of months ago, and we said, based on feedback from other staff groups that work in close to home, was a better um, opportunity in terms of trying to connect you and the services coming together. We are currently just doing a check on all school buildings in terms of making sure, sure that. Um, there is that safe vestibule space for people to go into, building that space before the 
really good to see. So there's work to do to make sure that happens. Um, um, and that will hopefully, um, in terms of uh, energy usage and all things, we have the most schools in the country, 203 schools, more than 60 schools, more than anywhere else. Um, and that has huge impact in terms of our efficiency. So we need to maximise the school estate. So I think it's important to put that down that there's been extensive engagement with staff on that. Staff see that as a positive. I think the second thing in terms of staff engagement, just for clarity, that we have engaged with, um, I have in the last year, was it holiday again, um, and the working conditions of staff are, are acceptable in some of the schedules. We don't really meet the requirements in terms of our female staff, in terms of access to to toilets on site. So there are a number of things that we do definitely need to act quickly, okay. um, but we need to be clear that in terms Don't of finding the issues with <laughs> Okay, members, um, I've not seen anyone who's uh, opposed to the proposed approach to this. So can we agree that? Agree. Members, the, you're invited to all of these meetings, whether you're a member of the board or not, um, especially the workshops. And the workshops are where all the work's done. Yeah. This generally tends to be the talking shop, but the real work is done at the workshops. So by all means, turn up at the workshops. Um, and, and you'll see far more of the process going forward. It's very informal, they're not recorded, etc. So you can come along here and, and voice your opinion and take part. Thank you all, Ralph. That's the end. Thanks. 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 Thanks.